Good morning, guys. Today we're going to look at graphs of functions. First, we're going to start by analyzing them, then we're going to look at some different parent functions. Um, so take a couple minutes. I want to see how you guys do with answering or identifying each of these things, starting with is it a function, then work your way on down. Uh, so let's see if you can kind of figure out just by the names of them and looking at the way the graph is going down, uh, what each of these would be, and then um, I'll come in and we'll talk about what they actually mean. Uh, so pause the video, take a couple minutes, and see if you can identify all of these things. So hopefully you were able to come up with all this. Let's check and see how you did. So first thing, is this a function? So we go through and we look at a function. Think back to what you did in Algebra 1. Graphically speaking, we determine if we have a function by seeing if it passes the vertical line test. So what I ask myself, is there any vertical line that could be drawn on this graph that would intersect the graph more than one time? Because we know a vertical line represents all the x values Sorry, all of the y values for a specific x value. So, for example, if I drew a vertical line right through this portion of the graph at this x value, whatever it happens to be, see how there's only one point on the curve associated with this specific x value? So that vertical line test, or that vertical line intersecting one time tells me that there's only one y value for that one x value, and that meets our definition of a function. And that's because every single vertical line, because there are infinitely many vertical lines between here and here, every single vertical line because of the shape of this graph uh, would only intersect one time. So yes, since it passes the vertical line test, we can say that this graph is a, the graph of a function. Domain and range. Very similar to what we talked before with domain. Uh, we're just looking at it graphically instead of algebraically as we did in the last lecture. But domain is what's my group of numbers that I can plug in? What are my possible x values that actually produce a y value? So that's just the x coordinates from every point from here to here. And that's just going to be from negative 5 up to 6. As we can see, the graph is continuous. There are no gaps in the graph, horizontally speaking. Uh, we don't leave any x's out. I didn't come to negative 1 and then stop and then jump over here to a positive 2 before I start graphing again. Now, every single x value from negative 5 up to 6 is represented. Now, notice how we have an open circle here at 6 instead of a closed circle like we do on the negative 5. And that open circle is just like it is when we do inequalities. You do an open circle on your number line. That shows that we're getting as close as we can to that 6 but not actually including. So that's why we bracketed the negative 5 because we actually have a point at negative 5 and we parentheses, I got to burn, put a parenthesis on the 6 um, to show that we're getting as close as we can to the 6 but not actually including the 6. Range is the height of the graph um, and realistically you just have to look at the curve if you want to get the graph, say you were given the equation of a function and they said what is the range, you're just going to have to look at the graph of that function to say, it, do I have a highest point or a lowest point? Because that's what range is. It's all the y values that get produced in a, from a function, from all those inputs. So it's all the possible y values that get produced. And so if I don't have a highest or lowest point, then it's negative infinity to positive infinity. Assuming we don't have any graphs or chunks missing in between, uh, which could potentially happen with a piecewise function or some other type of function. We'll look at some more of those later on. Um, but so it's, it's all the possible y values or all the y values that get produced um, by inputting all those elements of the domain. So in this case, you can see our lowest point is at negative 5, highest point is at positive 6, and you said we have no gaps in the graph. So every place we have a y value, there is some portion of the curve associated with it. So all values between negative 5 and 6, so, and we're including those two y values because uh, we actually have points at those, <coughs> at those y values. Uh, intervals of increase, decrease, and constant are pretty straightforward. Intervals of increase is where I'm, my y value, as my x values go from left to right, my y values are increasing. So from negative 5 to negative 3 on my x, my y's went from 3 to 4. So that was an in interval of increase. From negative 3 to negative 1, my y values stay constant at 4, so negative 3 to negative 1 is an interval of constant. From negative 1 to positive 1 on my x, my y's decreased from 4 to negative 2, so an interval of decrease. Uh, from 1 to positive 3, my, in, my 
X values went from 1 to positive 3, but Y values went from negative 2 to 6. So 1 to 3 is another interval of increase. Uh, 3 to 5, we went from 6 to negative 5 on the Y, so 3 to 5 was an interval of decrease. And then from 5 to 6, our Ys went from negative 5 up to 2, so that's an interval of increase, 5 to 6. And then we're just putting union between all of those um, intervals to say we're grouping them all together because all of them satisfy whatever it is we're looking for. Uh, why are we not using brackets if we actually include these points? Well, the point, reason is because we're in a, at that point, we're, not in, we're neither increasing nor decreasing. Uh, we're just, that's kind of where we transition from an increase to a decrease or to a constant area. So we're not doing anything at those points. It's all between those points that we're actually, the increasing and decreasing and constant is going on. So that's why we don't use brackets on any of those. So you'll never have brackets on your intervals of increase, decrease, or constant. Uh, maxima, maximum, we know what that is. It's a high point. Maxima is just the plural of that. It's if I have multiple ones of those. So relative just means if I looked immediately left and immediately right, I'm going to get a, I'm going to get points lower than this. So if it's the relative maximum, that means everything to the left of it, everything to the right of it. Sorry, immediately to the left and immediately to the right are below it, have lesser y values. So if we look. Uh, 3, 6 is the only point that's a high point, that's a peak. Because immediately left and immediately right, we have lesser y values. This negative 3, 4 or the negative 1, 4 look like they could potentially be a uh, relative, uh, relative maximum. But if I look to the left of negative 3, the y values are below. But immediately to the right of negative 3, the y values are not below it. Okay, see how the y value is constant there? So that means I'm not looking at a relative, I'm not looking at a maximum nor minimum. Uh, so relative minima, same thing. Immediately left and immediately right, the y values are higher or greater than what we're looking at. So at 1, negative 2 to the left and to the right has greater y values. Uh, 5, negative 5 to the left and to the right of that uh, has greater than negative 5. So that's why those are my relative minima. My global, global just means not immediately left and immediate right. It means everything to the left and everything to the right. So not every function has a global maximum or minimum. Not every function has relative maximum or minimum. It just depends on the curve. Uh, this is really where we get our domain, or so where we get our range from, from the global maximum or the global minimum. The, the highest point of that that function can achieve or the lowest point that that function can achieve. So global maximum means everything to the left and everything to the right of that point is below that point and then global minimum says everything to the left and everything to the right of that point is above that point. So these are our relative maxima and uh, global maxima and all, all that good stuff. So this is kind of all the different ways we can analyze or break down the individual pieces of a function. Uh, next, we'll look at a couple special types of functions. So give me a few seconds. I'll get that information up here, and we'll check those out. Okay, let's talk about even functions and odd functions. Uh, very quickly, pretty simple concept, but very important. So an even function says that if I plug in x and the opposite of x, both of those will produce the same value. We can also look at it graphically. If I flip, if I horizontally reflect, negative x means horizontal reflection. If I horizontally reflect my graph, I will produce the exact same graph. Odd functions say that if I plug in negative x into a function, then I will get the opposite of what I would have got if I had plugged in positive x. So if I plug in a number, <clears throat> Sorry, a number and its opposite, I will get opposite values. The same value, but it'll be opposite. Sorry, the same absolute value, but they will be opposite inside. Uh, what that says graphically is if I was to horizontally reflect the graph, uh, it's the same thing as if I were to vertically reflect the graph. So just a couple of quick examples. Uh, if you had x squared, y equals x squared, we know graphically speaking it looks like this. Well, if I was to flip that horizontally, you get the exact same function. Well, for an odd function, if I had uh, y equals x cubed, if I was to flip that horizontally, 
I get this shape right here. Well, that's the same thing I get if I was to flip it vertically. So that's graphically what's going on, or we can look at it as plugging in uh, the opposite of a number and getting the same thing, or plugging in the opposite of a value and getting the opposite um, result. So what we're going to look at is <clears throat> determining if these are even, odd, or neither. <clears throat> and the, most functions are neither. It's just certain ones that are symmetric uh, around the x, uh, y axis and the ones that are symmetric around the origin. Uh, those are few and far between, but uh, they do make life a little bit easier in certain cases when we are able to identify them. So looking at this one first. Best technique I've seen is just plug in negative x and see does it give me the same thing or is it going to give me the opposite? So let's just put negative x in here. So f of negative x is equal to negative x to the fourth minus three negative x squared. Remember, in, we're doing a substitution, so we put parentheses around what we've substituted in, and then we just clean it up. Negative x to the fourth, a negative to an even power, comes out as positive. Negative x squared is going to be positive x squared. So we can see that f of negative x is identical to f of positive x. Since these two are the same, that tells us that the function is even. Well, let's look at the second example here. Plug in negative x, or the opposite of x, odd power, sorry, negative raised to an odd power stays negative, so we get negative x cubed minus 3, so g of negative x, is it equal to exactly g of x? No, it's not. So these two are not equivalent. Well, let's go through and test to see if it's equal to negative g of x. Negative g of x just says multiply negative 1 times the entire function, which is x cubed minus 3. So when I distribute that, I get negative x cubed plus 3 is negative g of x. Is g of negative x and negative g of x, are those equivalent? No, one, they both have negative x cubes, but that's got a minus 3, that's got a plus 3. So these are not equivalent, not the same, that, therefore uh, they're neither even nor odd. Pretend that's an i. <clears throat> Let's look at the last function. You want to pause it and try it yourself, see what you come up with? Go ahead, otherwise I'm going to work through it. Start by plugging in negative x, so I get negative x times square root of negative x squared plus 1. Clean it up. Negative x, and we dump those parentheses there. So negative x times negative x squared is positive x squared. So does h of negative x equal our original function? No, it doesn't. We have this negative x on the outside. So let's check and see if it's equal to negative h of x. So we've tested it for evenness. Now we're going to test it for oddness by doing negative 1 times the original. x times the square root of x squared plus 1. So that's just a single term. So it's just negative 1 times the coefficient of the square root. So it's negative x times the square root of x squared plus 1. And we can see h of negative x and negative h of x are equivalent. They were both identical. So since they were the same, we can say that they are, uh, that the original was an odd function. Okay, so that's even an odd functions. Again, it seems kind of trivial, but as you get into calculus, you'll see some applications of being able to identify um, which, what you're working with, evens or odds, or if it's neither one and you're going to go a different route in your work. Uh, Next one, we'll look at graphs of piecewise functions. We've worked with them before in the previous lecture as far as evaluating kind of conceptually what they mean. Uh, we're going to start looking at the graphs of them here in a second. So let me get that information up and uh, we'll be started on it. Here we have a couple of piecewise functions. Uh, let's look at how to graph them. <clears throat> so if I've got this, remember we're going to graph, it's two different graphs. We'll only use a specific portion of it uh, depending on what the portion, the uh, interval of the domain that applies to that function is. So what I always do is I just graph both of them and then we, again, highlight the section that we need to. So I'm going to start with x squared minus 4. We know we have a look, it's a 
simple uh, vertical shift, vertical shift of our x squared function. So just going back, uh, shift it down four, one, two, three, sitting at negative four, no stretches, none of that stuff. We know that we're up one over one in both directions. So I would, I would get something that looks about like that. Okay, so that's our x squared minus 4 function. That's the first function we were getting. Then we have this second one, negative 2x plus 6. So negative 2x plus 6 means go to positive 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Slope is down 2 over 1. And we're going to get this function right here. Now the question is, I obviously, this is not, both of them together don't make a function because we're failing the vertical line test all over the place. But if we restrict them to the portion of the domain that they apply to, then we do get a function. So this says when x is less than 1. So to the left of 1, 1 is my boundary line here. To the left of 1, I'm going to use the x squared minus 4. And I do not use it to the right of 1. To the right of 1, from 1 on, we're going to use the negative 2x plus 6. So from 1 on, I'm going to use the other equation. So to the left of 1, I will not. So we just sketch both of them and then highlight which interval they actually apply to. Now I have an issue at the moment in that I currently have this drawn, the way I have it currently drawn, it is not a function. Where, what point or points are causing this to not be a function? Well, it's right here at 1. Notice how at 1, I have two different y values assigned to this 1x value, and that goes back to right here. The first function, the first equation, does not apply at 1. It's the second equation that applies at 1. So at 1, I should draw an open circle to show that we're not equal to 1 on this portion of the curve, we're equal to 1 on this portion of the curve. So this is an example of the graph of a piecewise defined function. So as if we looked at this, the domain we can see is negative infinity to positive infinity because here we're negative infinity up to 1 because it's a polynomial so we have no restrictions on this side. And then the right side is also a polynomial so we have no restrictions uh, from that point on. And since we're including 1 in at least one of the two curves, negative infinity to positive infinity would be your domain. Domain would be negative infinity to positive infinity. Now the range, looking for an overall high point or low point, do we leave any numbers out in the middle? Well, this keeps going up, so I don't have a maximum on this side. This one keeps going down, so I don't have a minimum on that side. And even though this chunk of numbers was left out, in this area, they were we did get to include those y values in one portion of the graph, actually in both portions of the graph. An example of something that would have a disruption in the range, this range, as we just said, goes forever up, forever down, and there's no, there are no y values in the middle that don't have some portion of the curve assigned to them. So this range would be negative infinity to positive infinity. If I had a function that looked like I don't know this, say we went from here I don't know, it could, it could be like this and go to here and then we could have it connect off like that and then Something like that. So this one right here, you can see we do have an overall maximum, something along those lines. So that would be a range uh, from that point on, or if it even went from that point up. So say it was here to here. So we have range values from here down, but we don't have range values in this area here. So when you're doing piecewise functions and looking at their range, we're looking to say, is there an overall maximum or minimum, a global maximum or a global minimum? And do we have any portions of the y-axis of y values that do not have some portion of the curve actually associated with it? Uh, so just a couple of things to keep in mind when we're looking at the range on piecewise functions. 
Now we looked at this function right here, and we graph it. Um, if you want, pause the video, take a second, graph that. Um, if not, I'll go ahead and do it real quick. It doesn't take long. So x plus 2, so I'm going to 2. Slope is negative 1, so that's down 1 over 1. And then the x plus 2 for the other function, the other equation, positive 1 in the slope, so up 1 over 1. And then we use the first equation to the left of 0. We get to include that point and not to the right of 0. We get to use the second equation to the right of 0 because it's greater than 0. And we get this function right here. Well, this function should look very familiar to us because this is actually the absolute value of x plus 2. And the reason absolute value has that sharp point because it actually is a piecewise defined function. This is how we define the absolute value of a function. It's to the left of our vertex, we're going to use the negative slope of that equation. And then to the right of the vertex, we're going to use the positive slope of that equation. Or vice versa if we had a vertical reflection. So absolute value of a function is um, actually a piecewise defined function. We've just come up with these specific rules for graphing it, so we've never had to look at it as a piecewise defined function. So it's the positive and negative of x. That's what absolute value means. And to the left of 0, we use the negatives. To the right of 0, we use the positives and so on. So that's graphs of piecewise defined functions. We can have gaps. Just make sure you don't have more than one point assigned for a specific x value. Or they can be connected and continuous, as we have um, right here. So that's piecewise defined functions. Uh, give me a few seconds and we're going to talk to get stuff up here to talk about step functions. Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about step functions. Uh, step functions, not very, very common. You don't see them a whole lot of places, but you know they are very interesting to look at. So let's look at what a step function is. Uh, we define it as a function whose graph resembles a uh, staircase or steps. The most common one that we work with is the greatest integer function, also known as the floor function. Uh, there are a few others that you'll come across as you go uh, advance into your math courses. The notation um, is that we put this kind of double bracket over the variable. This double bracket on the variable, in this case for the greatest integer function, says that we want the greatest integer less than or equal to x. It's also called the floor function. I think of it as the round down function. Okay, so anytime I get a number greater than, I'm going to round that down. Uh, get a number greater than um, a whole number, I'm going to just round, or than an integer, I'm just going to round that down. So pretty straightforward. If I had f of x equals the greatest integer function, or the floor of x right here, the greatest integer less than or equal to x, then I would just evaluate a few points. So f of negative 2, well, what's the greatest integer less than or equal to negative 2? Negative 2. So when x is negative 2, y is negative 2. f of negative 1, greatest integer less than or equal to negative 1 is negative 1. So negative 1, we're at negative 1. 0, greatest integer less than or equal to 0 is 0. Greatest integer less than or equal to 1 is 1. So what you see is we're going to get really just our normal f of x equals f, or sorry, f of x equals x function. If I can get this to plot correctly, there we go. Hard to write these sideways. So we get our normal slope of 1, y-intercept of 0 function, all that good stuff. The difference is I don't disconnect them with a smooth curve because what's going on in between is really where the greatest integer function comes into play. So what's going on in between each of these? Well, let's say f is 1.1. Ask the question. So when we're at 1.1, we're sitting right here, 
the greatest integer less than or equal to 1.1 is 1. Right? Less than or equal to means below 1.1. So the greatest integer less than or equal to 1.1 is 1. Well, what's the greatest integer less than or equal to 1.2? 1. Greatest integer less than or equal to 1.5? Still 1. Greatest integer less than or equal to 1.9? 1. What's the greatest integer less than or equal to 2.1? Well, that's two. That's why I call it the round down function. We just always go back to the most recent integer we crossed. So everything from, uh, from two back to one is all going to round down to one. So everything between here is going to stay at one. Now, as soon as I get to two, I jump to two. So just like we did with the piecewise functions, if it's a function, we can only have one value at each of these. 2 is equal to 2. So, or sorry, the greatest integer less than or equal to 2 is equal to 2. So as we get to 2, we're going to put that open circle right there on the end of it. So that's what all this is. It's constant between each integer interval. So this is how it ends up looking like a staircase. This is why we've named it a step function. And you can see how super accurate my graph is. And there are many different manipulations. We can do all kinds of transformations, shift it up, left, change the slope, all kinds of stuff. You know, we could square this thing and get really creative and all kinds of things with it. But the general idea is when it go, comes time to evaluate, I've got to answer the question, what's the greatest integer less than or equal to x? And that's the greatest integer or floor function. Uh, we do have a least integer function, a ceiling function that we uh, work with on occasion. Uh, but that's the general of uh, about step functions. They're going to have this shape and design to them. Um, it's just how we define what's going to create those. Um, and it's always going to come back to be rounding down or rounding up so we stay constant on those integer intervals. <clears throat> so uh, I guess we realistically could write a function that we could just call it a rounding function and says if you're you know, less than one point or less than 0.5, we could round down, and if you're more than, you could round up. So, anytime you're not taking the value as it is, but you're rounding it off or moving it back to one integer or the other or some predetermined value, um, that's going to cause these stair steps to happen. So, uh, very interesting, kind of fun to play around with. Um, that's step functions. Last thing I'll talk about in this lecture is uh, just some parent functions, just kind of give you a general idea of what. Functions look like in general. It's just a recap of really all the functions we've talked about to this point in the year. So give me a second. I'll get that stuff up here and we'll chat about them. Real quick, something I do want to talk about on this that I forgot to point out. Um, domain and range. We can see we're accounting for every single x value. So the domain is still going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. But the range is... We can't write an interval notation because it's discontinuous. There's gaps in the range. There are no in-between values. It's all integers in the case we're talking about here. So the range in this case, we could not write an interval notation because it doesn't. we don't have continuous intervals. There are actually gaps, vertical gaps in the graph. And so our range, we would just have to write as um, all integers. Because the y values are only occurring at the um, whole number of integer uh, increments. So we would write all integers or the set of all real numbers such that they're integers or blah, 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 however you want to do it. But this is one where the domain or the range has uh, been manipulated a little bit. There's no maximum or minimum, so we're still covering positive infinity but negative infinity, but we're only counting the integer values. Okay, uh, real quick talk about parent functions. Parent functions are just functions uh, specifically of your really simple polynomials or your simple rational function, your constant function, absolute value function, and so on. It's the things that we haven't added or multiplied or negated anything to. It has the one basic operation of we're squaring this item, or we're cubing this item, or we're taking the absolute value of this item, or we're taking the log of this item. We haven't done any of that other stuff to it. We're taking one operation and perform one basic operation and performing it on it. That's the parent function. And the really nice thing about parent functions is they all work in the same little one by one box or negative one to positive one box. So 
that's where everything starts because if I plug in positive one, I get positive one. I plug in negative one, I get negative one. So we have this box and then the transformations we're going to talk about later on and we've talked a lot about previously but we'll focus more in terms of these general parent functions. Um, Transformations all just manipulate that negative one to positive one box. They'll move it up or down, left and right, or they'll compress or stretch that box out. But this is your basic, everything starts in this negative one to positive one relationship. So very important that you recognize that all of these are negative one to positive one boxes that are established uh, here. It's with the exception of the constant function, um, because that's just a horizontal line at whatever your constant happens to be. Um, I guess realistically we could have written it f of x equals 1 and then any multiplication of that is I guess shifting it up. I don't know. Uh, it, it gets weird when you talk about constant functions. Um, so it doesn't stretch it out, but you would have to have a shift to move that 1 up or down. But we're just going to say the constant function is the only one that doesn't work off the one by one box uh, like all the other ones do. And then we know our stretches would mostly impact that, but the shift will change that. Still the same size, but then moves it around. But the, we'll get into that when we talk more in depth about transformations. Uh, but just really good to know, to see how the curve is what changes, but the location and the size, um, it's just how they fit within that single negative one, positive one box. So these are all of our basic parent func functions. We've got exponentials and logs down there also with square roots and so on. Okay, um, that's, that's it for graphs of functions. A whole lot of stuff that we talked about. Um, talking about maximum, minima, vertical line test, um, domain and range, especially the range when we're talking about the graphs. Uh, parent functions, piecewise defined functions, step functions, uh, a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, go back and watch it again if you need to. There's a lot of terminology in here you need to be familiar with, but get all that, uh, just get all these notes taken out and we'll, we'll go really in depth with it in class and try to clear up any issues. Because like I said, I know I just crammed a lot of information into this lecture. So um, see you in class tomorrow and uh, be ready to talk about all this stuff.